name is Carmen Blair. I'm the Deputy Director of the San Mateo County Historical Association, and I would like to welcome you to this afternoon's Courthouse Docket. The Courthouse Docket is a monthly series of lectures and performances held here in historic Courtroom A, sponsored by Cypress Lawn Heritage Foundation. Each month, we explore a different aspect of local history. The Sequoia Healthcare District is celebrating 75 years of serving the community. You might have noticed as you came in today the new exhibit in the rotunda, Sequoia Healthcare District Then and Now. Further exploring that topic is today's panel. Introducing the panel is our moderator, Charlene Marco. Welcome. Thank you so much for that, Carmen. Can you all hear me in the back? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Well, as Carmen said, my name is Charlene Margo, and I'm co-founder of Nonprofit The Parent Venture, and we are fortunate to be both professional and personal connections to the Sequoia Healthcare District and Sequoia Hospital. As a Bay Area native, I have benefited from both, and our program, the Parent Education Series, is funded by the Sequoia Healthcare District, and I have personally spent wonderful time with two hip replacements at Sequoia Hospital, so I vouch for that wonderful organization. We are pleased to have with us today Pamela Gritzman, who's the CEO of Sequoia Healthcare District, Bill Graham, the current CEO of Sequoia Hospital, and Art Farrell, the former executive and current board member at Sequoia Healthcare District. So before we get started, each of them is going to tell a little bit about their current role and the history of the hospital and the healthcare district, but let me just give you some more details about today's featured presenters. Pamela Kurtzman joined Sequoia Healthcare District in 2006 to launch the HeartSafe program, and in 2010, she was appointed Director of Healthy Youth Initiatives. In 2014, she became Director of Grants and Programs before becoming CEO in January of 2018. As CEO, Ms. Kurtzman leads district efforts to foster health equity, defined as not simply the absence of disease, but rather the overall quality of life for all district residents. Welcome, Pamela. All right. To my right is Bill Graham, the president of Dignity Health Sequoia Hospital. As president, Bill oversees operations and strategy of a 2008 bed hospital serving the San Francisco Bay Area Peninsula, including the nationally recognized Heart and Vascular Institute, the Family Birth Center, and the Center for Total Joint Replacement. Prior to being named Sequoia's president in 2015, Bill served jointly as both Vice President of Physician and Business Development for Sequoia Hospital and Chief Strategy Officer for Dignity Health Bay Area Service Area. Under Bill's leadership, Sequoia has been recognized locally and nationally for exceptional patient care and quality, including being named as the fifth best hospital in the Bay Area by U.S. News and World Report in 2021. And last but not, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, Mr. Art Faro began his career at Sequoia Hospital in 1964 as Director of Personnel and Services, and he became Chief Executive in 1989. Under his decades-long leadership, Sequoia Hospital and the Sequoia Hospital District grew in both size and reputation. He also oversaw the transition from hospital district into a healthcare district when the hospital's management transferred to Catholic Healthcare West in 1996. For more than the past two decades, he has served as an elected board member of the Sequoia Healthcare District. Welcome, Art. <laughs> and now as promised, because we are here in the History Museum, each of these distinguished panelists is going to tell you a little bit more about the history of the healthcare district and the hospital from their perspective. Art, why don't you start us off? Okay, thank you. I don't know if that distinguished as you passed the baton. I don't feel very distinguished, especially with these masks. But just to give you a little, a little history, in 1938, which is 84 years ago, uh, a group of women led by Doug Beaver, some of you may know the Beaver family, uh, their descendants are still active with the Hospital Foundation. Uh, Doug Beaver led this group of women, appealed to the city council because they felt they needed a hospital. None of this is pre-World War II. Uh, 
So the city council approved the idea, but never got the funds to do it. And then World War II came out after World War II in 1945. The state legislature recognized that there's a need for hospitals, particularly in rural areas. Remember, Redwood City back then wasn't quite rural, but it also wasn't quite as busy as it is now. So because there was a dramatic need for healthcare facilities, uh, Doug Beaker and other citizens appealed to the district residents. And by district, we're talking about from a little piece of Foster City in the north to the Menlo Park, including Menlo Park, to the Palo Alto border, and then from the skyline to the bay. So I suspect that all, if, that most if not all of you are residents of the district and you're paying taxes to support what we're doing. The, the district then uh, got approval from the voters and they raised money through tax, taxes and decided to build a 106 bed hospital in the current site where it is now. That 100 bed hospital expanded dramatically, but I'll get to that in a minute. The opening ceremony, the groundbreaking ceremony, was led by uh, Chief Justice, um, blanking on his name, Earl Warren. Earl Warren uh, was governor of California at the time. He since became Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Uh, so it was a pretty distinguished panel who was here with the original groundbreaking. Uh, that 106 bed hospital ultimately became a 591 bed hospital with more than 591 patients in it. Bill would lose the rest of his hair if he had to deal with that <laughs> today. Uh, the, uh, the hospital under the, the first administrator, they were called administrators and not CEOs or presidents, uh, bought for the district a 171 bed convalescent hospital that was up for sale and incorporated that into Sequoia Hospital, which of course added beds, and that was for long term care. That building still stands. It's between 2900 Whipple and the office building on the corner, right? Opposite the emergency room. It's still there, and frankly, I don't know what it's being used for now. It, was, it had all kinds of uh, different services in there over the years. Uh, if, if Bill doesn't have a secret, he may tell us what he talks. Uh, it's an interesting structure. My understanding from the engineers was it's wrapped with metal tapes, metal belts, and in order to demolish it, it has to be done very carefully or it will just fly all over the place. I don't understand the engineering, but that's one reason why it wasn't demolished in the early years. It was just too costly to do. The, uh, oh, the, the, the hospital was always very creative and innovative. Back in the 70s, we got uh, Tom Fogarty, and I just noticed that there's a room over here for entrepreneurs. Tom Fogarty is a cardiovascular surgeon and an entrepreneur. He's got a fantastic winery up in Portola Valley. And frankly, if it wasn't for him bringing the heart program from Stanford to Sequoia, Sequoia might not be in existence today. We were suffering at the time. And he brought in two other famous cardiologists, and the three of them uh, continues to this day, along with other cardiologists as well. And that put us on the map. We also had some orthopedic surgeons that we were able to steal from Stanford, and that helped our orthopedic program. Uh, there, the, the services that we had without these outstanding physicians, uh, we really wouldn't have a hospital today. Oh yeah. During, during the years we've had, because of these high-ranking doctors, we had a lot of celebrities in the hospital. Uh, Jerry Rice, was, and wife, his wife was a patient, he lived across the street from the hospital for a while, and you can see him jogging up and down Alameda. He was there. Uh, we had John Madden walk in the dining room one day, and there's John Madden sitting there all by himself. His mother was a patient at the hospital. Uh, 
uh, Patty Hearst was a patient. She was a prisoner in Redwood City, and uh, she came in as a patient. I, I had the chance to go up and visit her. She was as skinny as a rail, very shy, very quiet, and clearly not happy being incarcerated. But we took good care of her anyway. Uh, and then there was Paul Newman. Paul Newman's cardiologist came to my office one day. He said, I have a celebrity coming in, but he doesn't want anybody to know. So he gave him a fictitious name, and I said, Here's, we'll send him up to such and such a room. He went up there directly, and then we sent an admitting clerk up to get all the information that you need for the patient. She came down to my office afterwards, and she was as pale as could be. She said, she walked in this room, and she saw these blue eyes, and she froze. And she said, oh, Mr. Newman, you're my second most favorite man. He said, who's your favorite, your husband? No, Cary Grant. <laughs> uh, so they would see, there were some fun times when it, running a, a big organization like that. But I have to say, leave it to Bill, I'm out of there. <laughs> uh, Back in 1995, we were struggling as a hospital. As I said, we've had situations where the place was overflowing. We had a wait list of people to get in. District residents had a priority. District residents got a discount on their bill. We had patients in the hallways. These are days when uh, elderly people, uh, particularly in winter times with us, upper respiratory diseases, were hospitalized. Today, they're not. People go home with it, doesn't matter what age, but much, much of it is handled by medicine at home. Uh, mothers would take uh, five days in the hospital after they delivered. Today, some of them are in and out the same day, some of them the next day. Unless there's a real problem, they, they uh, don't stay very well. So the census today is nowhere near five, in the 500s. And, Bills can speak to this better than I can, but I, there are times when it's less than 100. Uh, so, because of the drop in census and because we we're standalone, basically a standalone business, we decided that we should look for a partner, somebody in a large hospital system. So, I went to the board and suggested it. One of the board members wanted to throw me out, the rest of them were listening, and ultimately they all agreed that we really should find a partner. So we actually did a bidding process, and we had three responses, one from the Adventist system, but that didn't fit with what we wanted. And we had one from the uh, Columbia HCA, which was a for-profit outfit, which kind of turned us off a little bit, but they were interesting. And then Catholic Healthcare West. Well, ultimately, we went with Catholic Healthcare West, as I'm sure you know, which is now called Dignity. Is it got the new name yet? Common Spirit Health. Common Spirit Health. Health. Explain some of that, too. It's, it's, so the, the system is growing. And that really bailed us out. The, uh, with, without that system, we would not have been able to survive. Uh, we also looked at building a brand new hospital. And some people wanted it on, on a different site. We were looking at where Stanford is now in Redwood City and uh, decided let's just expand what we have. So we expanded that and to, to meet, the, meet the demands and make a much more efficient operation than we, have, than we had before. So I, I was very pleased to see Catholic Healthcare West take it over. Uh, they appointed uh, Glenn Vasquez, who was then the, the CEO. Uh, the first woman CEO in the hospital. I was the third CEO. Uh, and Glenna did, a, I think, a wonderful job. She then retired, and we found Bill. He was crawling around somewhere in the corners, and we pulled him out, and here he is. So I think uh, the hospital is doing very well. I, I must say, though, Max Griffin, who was the first CEO, had all the employees' checks printed with, I don't remember the exact words, but basically it said, remember, it's the patients who are paying you. And that philosophy has lasted, where it's, we're here to take care of patients. We're not here to make money, we're not here to do this, that, and the other thing. 
And because of that, uh, you, you talk to anybody who's been a patient, we've got two hip replacements here, uh, the care is spectacular because we encourage employees to really care about what they're doing. Well, basically, uh, I, I really don't have much more to add to what I said. I, I appreciate your being here. Uh, the posters downstairs that uh, were put up, if you want more information, you can read that. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Art. And now we're going to hear from Bill Graham, who's the current president of Sequoia Hospital. Thank you very much. And uh, maybe what I'll, I'll, where I'll start is to bridge from uh, Art's comments regarding the uh, uh, statement uh, on the bottom of the checks, because I think, uh, to ma in many respects, that is really still who Sequoia Hospital is uh, in our community. Uh, and uh, we talk a lot about the culture. We talk a lot about the culture having been established very early on as being about patients first and remembering that everybody who walks in the door is likely in some way a uh, loved one, a friend, family member, neighbor, whatever that might be. And that when you walk into Sequoia, that's really what you should expect. And you should expect the highest level of care uh, that we can offer you uh, uh, behind that commitment. Uh, and so Sequoia is uh, today still a, a very strong hospital. Uh, uh, we are recognized for the quality of our care as well as for the experience uh, that people have when they're at Sequoia. And, and when I talk to patients, you know, it's always a little bit nerve-wracking sometimes when you talk to patients because somebody's going to eventually have the experience maybe you didn't want them to have. But by and large, what we hear over and over and over again is that uh, they were just overwhelmed by how positive the experience was uh, at the hospital. And that if they weren't, they were really impressed with how people came together to then help make that experience a better experience for them. Um, so Sequoia uh, has been part of Catholic Healthcare West. I'm going to use that name first, and then I'm going to go through a series of names to kind of explain who we are. Uh, so in 1996, as Art shared, uh, joined Catholic Healthcare West, I think it really was a recognition that both the both Sequoia Hospital and the District Board and CHW really valued the type of culture that uh, Sequoia had, uh, and that it was in alignment with how we wanted to provide care at the other hospitals uh, within CHW. At that time, CHW was a pretty new organization. Uh, it uh, had been in existence for uh, roughly 10 years um, by a, an interesting coincidence. I happened to be at the party where they signed the paper to bring the first two uh, small hospital systems together uh, to form the company. Uh, and they were really looking at different ways and models in which they could expand uh, in Northern California in particular at that time uh, to really ensure that what we call kind of a mission-based um, or community-based healthcare uh, remain strong and relevant. And so Sequoia fit in with that uh, very naturally. Um, in uh, about 2012, um, for uh, some different reasons, but I think a recognition that we had a Catholic health system that by that time also had probably a third of its hospitals uh, as non-Catholics, that we needed a different name, a different way of representing ourselves. And so uh, the company name was changed to uh, Dignity Health. And I think that was actually a really good thing, especially for the hospitals like Sequoia that are not Catholic. Uh, it gave us a little bit more balanced uh, and even playing field, and a recognition that uh, we were as equals uh, within uh, the company. Uh, and then most recently, uh, Dignity Health merged with a company called Catholic Health Initiatives, a uh, large uh, health system uh, outside of California, Arizona, Nevada, where uh, Dignity Health has historically uh, resided. And so we are now part of a larger organization, about three years old now, called Common Spirit Health. I'm going to use the term Dignity Health just because that's what we use in California. It's a little bit simpler than to bounce back and forth uh, between all of the names. Uh, so uh, as part of uh, Dignity Health, I think the first thing uh, you know, that happened in our reference this is that uh, it really brought a financial stability to the hospital. Uh, we still have the same great doctors, we still have the same great experience, quality, 
uh, that uh, was there when the district was separate. But now we have a lot of resources that we can bring to the hospital to help run the hospital more efficiently, uh, to be able to buy things and contract for things uh, in ways that the hospital just simply couldn't do as an independent facility. Uh, so uh, it brought economic stability. It also brought with it then uh, the opportunity to grow and to continue to uh, seek out and provide new and unique services. Um, Art talks about 500 some odd people in the hospital, and uh, we're actually usually below 100 now in our acute care census. And, and the reason for that is what Art said: people don't stay in the hospital as long, uh, so the care that stays when they happen are much more acute. Um, and a lot of things that people used to be treated, uh, used to have treated in the hospital aren't there. So uh, we like to say we're small but mighty. Uh, we run a pretty lean, um, efficient organization. Uh, and really want to make sure, especially because stays are so much shorter uh, and people are really sicker in many cases uh, than they were in the past, uh, that we're providing uh, the same exceptional care. Uh, our heart program continues to be really a cornerstone uh, program for us, uh, and it's really been exciting over the last uh, you know, five, ten years to see the next generation of physicians uh, come. So, you know, Tom Fogarty is now retired. Uh, John Simpson, one of the cardiologists that came with him, is now retired. Uh, Roger Winkle, the electrophysiologist who came over about the same time as Tom is retiring uh, this month. Uh, and to see the way those practices have grown and evolved, uh, both in terms of bringing new people in, but also bringing new uh, techniques, uh, new things that they're able to do with technology. Uh, there's a wonderful picture in the uh, uh, downstairs for Roger Winkle, these banks of equipment. Everything that's in that bank now is in a little box. Uh, and it probably does a whole lot more than all of those banks of equipment did. Uh, so we're you know, really excited about that program. Uh, the Birth Center also uh, is an uh, exceptional program for us and we're very proud of. Uh, we are, I think, over 10 years we've been named the best place to have a baby uh, uh, on the peninsula uh, in Bay Area Parent Magazine. So we love that award. Uh, because we think it speaks to uh, the experience so many of our community members have uh, at Sequoia. Uh, and I can't, I have to mention the orthopedic program because that's come up a number of times. And I'll say there, there is a theme, you know, when I talk about our programs and the successes that we've had, uh, many of our physicians are physicians who came over from Stanford. Uh, we love Stanford, Stanford's a great organization. We also love it when Stanford physicians decide that Sequoia is a place that they're more comfortable uh, caring for their patients in. And that's because it is a smaller environment. It doesn't have that tertiary quaternary experience uh, that is absolutely critical and necessary, but not necessary for a lot of care that most people uh, wish to receive. So uh, we're always unhappy with that. We kind of chide our Stanford colleagues a little bit uh, over it, and uh, they, they understand and appreciate uh, why Sequoia is unique in that fashion. As I think about uh, Sequoia going forward uh, and where we are headed, uh, there's a, a probably three priority areas for us. The first is uh, really what I call reimagining our campus. So our reference, uh, the additional uh, building that we had in our uh, pavilion uh, for most of our inpatient services, that's left a lot of unused space uh, behind the hospital. And as we think through this transition from uh, people being in hospital beds to receive their care to more of an outpatient environment, we have a real opportunity, an exciting opportunity, to um, uh, maybe even take down some of the older buildings uh, and replace them with buildings that are designed to treat patients in an outpatient setting, outpatient surgery center, uh, imaging, uh, other things like that. And there's so many really exciting uh, technology advancements uh, that uh, I think we can bring into that environment that don't necessarily fit well in the acute care hospital any longer. Uh, so that's really our first goal. We'll be doing that work. We've started working with some architects and our clinicians uh, on that work. And probably in the next five years, uh, we'll be solidifying that uh, even more uh, in some of the construction. Uh, the other area of uh, focus for us is uh, primary care development. Uh, the uh, peninsula is blessed with incredible health care. Uh, yes, Koi is wonderful, but we also have Stanford, in one of the premier uh, hospitals uh, in the country, if not the world. Uh, we've got Mills Peninsula to the north of us, we've got El Camino to the south. Um, if you need health care, we've got Kaiser, an exceptional organization. If you need health care in the peninsula, uh, you have many, many wonderful options. 
but what you don't have necessarily is strong access to primary care physicians. And for most of us, that's really where our healthcare resides. Uh, and for a number of reasons, uh, this area is expensive, fewer physicians want to be in primary care. Uh, what we've seen is a real erosion in this community of primary care physicians. And so we've recently added uh, five physicians um, this year, new primary care physicians to our community. Uh, we are hoping to um, announce within two to three weeks a new clinic uh, where we'll be bringing in uh, four additional primary care physicians. And we're really looking at, over the next five years, uh, three to four new primary care physicians. We want to get to a network probably between 20 and 25 net new primary care doctors uh, in this community. Uh, and Art mentioned the, uh, the building with the spring wraps, uh, the 2940 building. We're actually reevaluating uh, use of that space uh, and uh, considering uh, a, a primary care clinic, probably a 12, 15,000 square foot uh, primary care clinic on that location. So again, part of that campus redesign, looking at how we do things differently in the space that we have. And then uh, the third priority area for us uh, is really focused on ensuring that everybody in the community feels that Sequoia is a place that is welcoming uh, for them. Uh, and uh, we put that in the context of our high quality care. We know that there are certain communities who historically have not felt that hospitals uh, have been a welcoming place, whether or not that is uh, based on race and ethnicity, uh, or that is based on uh, uh, being a member of the LGBT community, and we want to work towards how we break down those barriers. Uh, as it relates to the LGBT community, uh, we worked over the last two years with an organization called the Health Equality Index uh, to, uh, for lack of a better word, work through a check, work through a, uh, a survey uh, that says these are the things that you need to do as an organization to ensure that the LGBT community feels welcome and embraced in your hospital. Uh, and we're really proud of the fact that uh, in the two years that we've done this, we've been identified as a leader uh, with Health Quality Index, uh, which is the top uh, ranking you can receive. And the work that we did here locally at Sequoia Hospital led to the larger Dignity Health Organization in California this year also applying uh, to be uh, within the Health Quality Index. Uh, so we really were able to influence uh, the entire company and it is, without going into a lot of the details, it's the first time that a large Catholic health system has partnered in this way with the Health Quality Index. Uh, so we're proud of our uh, having led that. Uh, the other area of focus for us, uh, as I said, is then with uh, communities of color and uh, those who uh, may historically have not had access uh, to health care. Uh, and really looking at where are there unmet health needs within our community and how do we work together to do that. And we have uh, historically worked closely with the district. I think that's where the intersection is uh, with us uh, in that uh, work. And this year, uh, we announced that we will be contributing uh, uh, in partnership with the district $20 million annually for 20 years uh, to help support that work. And we'll work closely with Pamela and the district board on how those dollars are allocated uh, within our community to ensure that uh, we are addressing those <coughs> And so I'll conclude there, and we will move to the next slide. Well, thank you so much, Bill. And I want to say that in listening to Art and Bill, I know that Sequoia Hospital really does walk the walk and earn their reputation that they put on their checks. When I was in Sequoia Hospital for my second hip replacement, luckily, just before the pandemic hit, March 2020, I got a visitor bedside, and it was President Bill Graham. <laughs> who had apparently heard I was there through a friend and colleague, Marie Violet, and I, it got the nurses and the staff in quite a tizzy. <laughs> I may not have known that, but I am so impressed that you do things like that. And I can feel art when you talk about Sequoia Hospital, you still say we, it's still very much a part of you. So as a community, we say thank you. All right, Pamela Christman, CEO of Sequoia Health District, bring us to the future. Thank you. Yeah, I get the next exciting, um, Part of this and the, the, the new faces, but there is this is fun and interesting going down sort of this memory lane because even I'm learning some things. And but I think I know where you found Bill because when so I've been there since 2006, and when, when I first started at the district, the transition had not quite happened yet. And my offices were located in right next to the ER, 
And every time I went to the executive lunch to get coffee, <laughs> he was there every single time. My office so, was just a little too close to that spot. Yeah. Yeah. So that's when we got there. Pulled him out of there and said, you know what, it's not good. Then I was hiding over in that building that Art was talking about for a while, but we moved out of there. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so, so uh, yes, I've been there uh, to, uh, in the district for quite a long time. Um, and when I started at the district, um, we, we had just, as I said, had that transition. And I had, I, I, was, a, I was the first staff to be brought on besides the, the CEO and the, their executive assistant. I was the first one to be brought on to implement a brand new program that the district would, that would uh, introduce. And prior to that, think about the dollars, those tax revenue that were supporting the hospital. What happened to that, right? So what happened to that was that became dollars that healthcare district could then use to actually keep people out of your hospital. That's what really happened. The district came along and kept everyone out of the hospital, keeping them healthy and safe. Um, one of the things that I had um, that I had started was a, a program called Heart Safe, and that was. Um, to put AEDs in the community, in health centers, in, um, in community centers, libraries, all the public locations and schools, and then train people on how to use the AED. So right now, to this day, there are about 350 AEDs in your community, and there's an app called Pulse Point. You can find out where they are, and then we train regularly in CPR and go and all that. But um, that was the first thing. There was also a contractor that was brought in to oversee the distribution of community grants. And so the dollars at that time when I started, the revenue coming in was around $7 million of tax revenue. And the district always had the philosophy, and we should put that on our checks today because it hasn't changed. We're, we're here as a, as a result of these tax dollars the staff is, and we have a goal, 100% putting those monies right back out into the community. and. Um, and so this contractor was, um, was really tasked to um, go out to the community, go and visit our nonprofits, see which were good fits for our philosophy, our mission, and to um, distribute these grants. And that's what they did for a number of years until we brought out a new executive director who had experience with fundraising and overseeing grants and management. So we should bring that in-house. So that was around 2009, and so <clears throat> since then, the district has gone gangbusters, and that's the cool part I need to talk about. Um, my role has changed significantly, uh, but our mission and vision really never has been defined it. We've clarified it a bit. Um, the mission and the vision has always been to, to really take these dollars, put them out into the community to optimize the health and wellness of all of our district residents, all of them. Um, and, but we do end up focusing most of the dollars on those who are um, low income in the community or, or who more, are more vulnerable, have higher needs, and don't maybe have a health care home. And we work with those uh, community members to help um, assure that they do. And some of our partners are in this audience, and it's really great to see you. Um, <clears throat> so when, when we uh, brought the uh, grants program in the house, and that's when we were really able to get to know those community partners. It wasn't a contractor, it was us. It was three staff. And we went out, particularly our old, our, um, I don't say old CEO, retired CEO, who happens to be a little bit older, um, <laughs> worked with our board. And remember, I started as a baby, a junior member, I was a baby. But they, he worked with our board, and we really got to know our community. We got to go out, we got to engage with them, we got to really understand what these needs are, revisited the strategic plan, and, and um, worked with community members, and had um, you had discussions with people who were recipients of these dollars, and listened, and listened, and listened. And bringing it in-house really allowed us to form relationships with our community, our community leaders, our nonprofit leaders, and our individuals, again, who were recipients of the, of the dollars, so that it would inform us on how best to distribute these dollars and how to align with community needs. And, um, and throughout that process, we do work, and we still do, with Dignity, 
Um, there's a community health needs assessment. They have an excellent staff, tons of excellent staff. But Marie Bailey in particular, who's their kind of the community health outreach director and director of health and wellness that we work with, that in help them, um, helps inform some of the investments, connections that we make throughout the community. Uh, but those dollars that have now, so, so as you can imagine, the, uh, the, the revenue and the home crisis, because we're, we're funded through property tax, right, and commercial and residential. So what is now was seven million, we now get about 15 million a year. And again, our goal is to put 100% of that out into the community. So what I'm gonna do is tell you a bit of what those, those investments look like now and some ideas that we're considering for the future and then sort of how we kind of run and manage things. So I will tell you, we have grown from three staff to a big and mighty five with a couple of contractors. And our staff are, are they really are, they're exceptional, very compassionate people that i um, just so proud of. And we have a, an array of um, ex background and experiences. Jenny Bratton, who is our director of Oh, she just got a promotion. She was our director of grants, grants and programs, which is now our director of grants and and I'm really forgetting her new title. It's so exciting. But she's basically here to help me integrate all the new programs. Jenny's over here. She's a former teacher from uh, Woodside High School, and so she just comes in like an idea machine, and um, and really ambitious and compassionate and smart. And Heidi Stanford. Uh, is back in the back. She's our uh, executive coordinator. She, she literally keeps me in shape. <laughs> um, she runs everything from all of the accounting, the books, the board documents and agendas, to the office, making sure things are, um, are just always clean and perfect, and she's great. And then Luz Garcia is in the back here. She's our newest um, staff. She runs our communications and our Support the Strong program. And so she's come in and in the last year during COVID and it's just kind of gotten thrown out there, um, beginning with the um, communications for the vaccine clinic that we partnered with David Nealon to what was now our health fair coming, which I'll tell you guys about. You're going to get excited about that. Um, and so, so I'm going to go back a bit about where these $15 million go. And, um, and again, we want to get all of that out. And many, of the, um, many of you know we're primarily a funder. To date, but we do have several of our own programs. And um, while I was uh, while I was doing the Heart Safe program, I was putting AEDs out in the schools. And um, and one of the teachers who was just bless his heart, he just like sat down with me and he said, "You know what, Pamela? It's really great to get an AED, and it's really great to get trained in CPR. But you know what? We have kids coming to school who their parents." Their parents have to cut the tips of their sneakers off because they're outgrowing their shoes and they don't have shoes to wear to school and they're hungry. And what can you do about that? And that's the sort of thinking where, of, where of this idea of there's so much need if we talk to the right people. And that Healthy Schools Initiative funds um, all eight school districts within our region and it, it supports each of the school districts with a wellness lead or a wellness director who then oversees the implementation of the other several programs that it supports. Uh, we also have a um, PE Plus program that we started in the City School District. This was a time when their budgets were devastated. I don't know if you remember this back in 2010, 2011, the school districts were barely had enough money to make ends meet at all, let alone supply, uh, provide things like physical education and school nurses, right? And, and definitely not counselors. And so the district partnered with the school districts to provide those services because we know, we know, we, you know, we have our partners here. People, students and teachers, we would say now, cannot learn effectively if they are hungry or stressed or even if they're not getting enough activity, if they're not getting proper nutrition, if they're not healthy and well, it's really tough to learn. So while the school's mandate is focused on learning, our mandate is focused on health. Together, we help each other achieve optimal health for the students. And thank goodness, because of COVID, I'll tell you that, I'm that next, because we've been really substantially supportive of our school districts. Fortunately, um, fortunately we've been there. And um, 
And so that, that's one of our biggest grants. We also have our community grants, which is now led by Jenny Bratton. And again, our grants program we're really proud of because we fund around 60, 60 different nonprofits. Um, we align, we really work to align our school program, our, our, um, our grants program, and all of our other programs like Samaritan House. We fund Samaritan House about a million a year in the clinic. I'll talk about that separately too, but we make sure that everything's sort of aligned. They all make sense. Everything, to, um, uh, the programs that we provide and our nonprofits provide are running effectively. But what I'm most proud about is with the grants is we don't just fund our partners. We actually are there to help them grow and succeed um, when they have a concern or a problem that maybe they're not meeting the objective that they proposed. Because we also are very diligent about keeping tracks of what they're doing. We are there to help them, not to reprimand them or say, what's wrong with you guys? You know, we're not going to fund you again. It's more like, let's help you So because your strength is our strength, right? We couldn't do what we do and we aren't going to be without your support. And so back to those checks, I mean, this is why we're here, is to make sure the health and wellness of all of our community is supported. And, um, and so we have our grants program, that's 3.7 million this year. And then five million. We also, as I said, fund uh, a couple of medical clinics significantly. Samaritan House, Jason Wong, Dr. Wong, the medical director of Samaritan House. That clinic was founded by, or at least suggested by Katie Kane, right? One of our, uh, our retired board directors. Probably, help me with this, 20 years ago? Something like that? Yeah. Something like that. And it's growing strong and needed more than ever. And this is a time back then we couldn't even imagine the needs that would arise by 2022, right? And so we, the other partner of Ravenswood, um, although they are located in East Palo Alto and that's not in our district, about 3,000 of our district residents go there every year to receive care. And so that care is everything. So the Samaritan House is no insurance. You have to please are undocumented. This is changing with the, the health insurance changes now, but that was where people have no other resources. And they would go and receive excellent, amazing care, dignity and respect and compassion. And that's what Samaritan, would, that's what Samaritan House would provide. And oral health as well. And mental health. Right? And 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 the um, care the, the food um, what's it called caring food, food pharmacy. Food pharmacy. Yeah, so that people with diabetes or special diets who were low income and had trouble accessing the pro correct foods that they need to support their, their healthy diet could go there and if they would work with a dietitian and, and that dietitian would um, would provide all the foods they need at no cost to support their health. Um, and so we have our clinics and then we fund um, a number of the nonprofits that um, aren't necessarily within a grant. We, we have to, are piloting a few innovative programs. A couple of years now, the Lyft program, a partnership with Lyft and Uber to uh, provide access to um, most of our seniors who could no longer drive. We, didn't, we wanted to ensure they were not isolated at home. We wanted to get them to these really wonderful community day centers that we support. So it would give them rights to that, to back and forth to their, uh, to their community centers. And then I expanded to get them to their doctor's appointments. And, uh, and that's now expanded to get them to uh, grocery stores. And um, I don't think we're going to go as far as entertainment quite yet, but we're exploring different ideas. Um, and, and a new partnership with Ability Path, so the, uh, people with um, disabilities who want to work and can work can get to their jobs. So there's a lot of different innovative ideas. Through our school program, we have been able to fund um, a number of different innovative programs to sort of pilot, and uh, and so you know I can talk a lot about those. But what I really will talk about is our COVID response and how we've really been able to um, be present for the community um, when when COVID hit, and that is the the idea of a healthcare district. People don't even know what we are. They think they don't think about us. Could you imagine if you didn't have a water district or a fire district or a school district? Well, people who look like until you need us, right? Um, the school was one, the school and our grants and our nonprofits were one of the first that were just devastated when, when COVID hit. COVID. 
what, what do we do now? We can't go, we can't serve these people. Kids can't come to school. Uh, it was really frightening, remember that? Um, and so one of the things that we, we've been very rigid, although, as I said, we're very, we're, we have a very collaborative partnership style with our grantees. We're also, um, we're rigid and we have high expectations for them. These are tax dollars, but we want to fund those programs that we know are promising, that's doing well, they're serving a deep need. And uh, the COVID hit, it was more challenging for people, for any of our partners to provide the services, especially the services that they outlined in their proposals and said, we're going to provide this service or that, so they don't want to do it. So one of the first things we did was step up and say, let's make the dollars that we provided more, um, more flexible, so you could use them now instead of just for the program you can no longer provide, but you can use them for operations, for maintaining your staff, for um, purchasing food and providing that to the community. Whatever you see fit, and you ask us first, but we were, you know, really, we were looking to support our partners. And in the schools, we help provide PPE, we help provide um, trainings for school nurses, we made sure that we helped our partners who provided mental health services, um, be able to pivot to doing that all online because we saw that need shoot up, right? So, and we had originally put three million dollars in for a COVID emergency response. We used all that, and then we built a COVID strategic plan that had several phases to it. Um, our initial response to sort of this recovery phase to this maintenance. So we're sort of in that recovery maintenance part now, but we are transitioning to sort of a new strategic plan based on what we've learned from the pandemic. And really, some of the, I'd say some of the social problems that we've known existed, but that really got delighted during COVID. Social and the economic, that just got that extra exacerbated, right? And so um, our big focus um, currently, and I'm telling it on the future, is that we um, that we really look to what the community is saying, that we're listening, and that we are very, very focused on diversity and on health equity and um, racial equity and inclusion. As to Bill was talking a lot about that, we've always done that, but we haven't been as explicit, and it doesn't leave people with really knowing exactly what we're doing. So. Um, so we are explicitly, um, that is our foundation in everything we do, and we're communicating it more clearly and setting really strong goals and objectives and strategies to address each area of concern for our community. And um, we are literally in the strategic planning phase now to kind of take it from COVID to this is what we're doing for the next three years. and. Um, and I just remembered something. I forgot to tell you who oversees our community, our school health initiative because she's not here in the audience today. But Dr. Karen Lee, we have a fabulous a pediatrician who oversees our school health initiative. And um, and I haven't mentioned because I just she wasn't in my site for a moment. Um, she's dealing with you know again we see we fund and support the gamut of people's lives changes and her changes her dad is very sick now so she's with him and um, but we have been there we all through birthing to hospice and that's kind of what we do to support our community and moving forward um, we're doing that with this equity on this lens on equity and inclusion again where people may have felt left, left out um, we think we're meeting the needs and we work with our partners to help us to do that our partners who are culturally sensitive and know this community, but we're still learning. We are still learning. We're never going to say we got it all, but we are certainly um, working towards that. And in the future, one of the things that Bill talked about, we are going to be looking at some really significant collaborative opportunities. And I'm not going to put anything out there yet, but we've got some ideas. Um, as you imagine, our revenue is increasing, as I tell you, and. Um, a couple of uh, a couple of uh, extra dollars have come in that we were anticipating because the program ended, a need ended, and so we are focused on getting those dollars out.
to through some uh, really exciting opportunities that um, I don't want to say until the boards approve them, but they're certainly going to meet some even more substantial needs in the community. And I'm excited that we've got this great team and a great board and really great community partners to help us achieve that. And, um, and I am, I think, just excited about what's next coming out of the pandemic and, um, and thinking about the next phases of the district. Thank you so much, Pamela. That was wonderful. And I just want to say, as a testimony to Pamela and the district leadership, my work on the Parent Education Series now, the Parent Venture, is just one of many programs that they fund. But we literally started 17 years ago, Pamela knows this story, with 25 people in the library at Menlo Atherton High School. The Healthcare District was our first funder, $7,000 in 2009, and we've served 120,000 parents, students, and educators, now not just from the Bay Area, but across the country and around the world. But we would not be here for the video library with 50,000 views if it were not for Pamela and the healthcare district. So thank you. Well, you know, with that, just to pick up on that story, I saw this amazing work she was doing in the schools. I was like, what are you doing just right here? Why are you just at Menlo? You need to be all of our schools, right? And because we had the partnerships with the schools and we had the the, the program, we could really, make, that's how we can support these kind of things and grow them and nurture them because of our community connections and collaborations and our great team. Yeah, thank you all. Wonderful, wonderful discussion today. So we have a few minutes together. Does anybody have any questions for our farm or the program or the Questions, questions? Okay, we're going to take a short break and well, I, I, I do have a question, since we do have a Fogarty gallery. Can you tell me a little bit more about what Dr. Fogarty was doing at Sequoia and how long he was there? Well, I'll, I'll lead off since I was involved in bringing you from Stanford. Uh, Tom Fogarty grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, Ohio. relatively poor kid who everybody, this, these are from his words, everybody in this family thought he'd never make it in this world. Well, he proved it otherwise. He, uh, as he claims, he's a multi, multi-millionaire now. Very successful inventor, entrepreneur, cardiovascular surgeon, and wine maker. He's got a great winery up in Cortola Valley if you ever feel like taking a ride up on Skyline and stopping there for a wine tasting, it's well worthwhile. Uh, he's, he's, he's the kind of guy, you, if you met him, you would not think he was this eminent cardiovascular surgeon. But he, because he came, he came to us from Stanford, uh, before he came, he had certain demands, which we clearly met. It was money well spent. And then he brought in the other two eminent cardio, cardiologists, electrophysiologists and cardiologists, the other basic cardiologists. And that really put us on the map. That also attracted other specialties because we were then on the map. And orthopedists came. We got one from, in fact, our chief of radiology came to me one day and said he, he went to see this orthopedic surgeon and he didn't seem very happy with Stanford. Why don't you call him and see if he wants to come over? So I called Mike Dillingham and he did bring his group over. And, well, it stayed for quite a while and then went back to Stanford and went into private practice and I don't know where he is right now. But anyway, uh, Fogarty uh, really put us on the map as a big, big help. And, and I'll add, you know, Dr. Fogarty was no longer at Sequoia when I started there in 2001. But uh, a couple of things with him is he, he really set a foundation for the cardiac surgery uh, program and also really the cardiology program that we have today. And I think there were a couple ways in which he was very innovative. Uh, he was certainly an inventor. He designed numerous devices and tools and uh, techniques for uh, how people could do uh, heart surgery better. But he also was one of the early physicians to really look at data. Uh, what were the outcomes of the patients? How are we tracking uh, the outcomes of our patients? How are we using data to improve care? And the foundation that he laid is still with us today. Uh, we still are very, very data focused, um, always looking at the, um, 
uh, clinical outcomes uh, where things went the way we thought they should, where we thought there were opportunities for improvement, uh, and then incorporating those uh, improvements into the practices. So I think it, his legacy really continues in Sequoia. Uh, another fun way in which uh, we are uh, continuing uh, or exploring in how we may continue that relationship. Um, uh, as he moved out of clinical practice, went more towards uh, device development and, and managing some of his companies, uh, one of the things he wanted to do uh, for his legacy was create a pathway for other physicians to do what he had done uh, and to be innovators. And uh, that led to the formation of the Fogarty Institute uh, in Mountain View. And uh, we recently have begun conversations with uh, the leadership of the Fogarty Institute on uh, some ways in which physicians at Sequoia Hospital can participate. Uh, and that is going to range from uh, opportunities to look at education, as well as uh, potentially even opportunities for some of our uh, physicians to uh, participate in their programs for helping bring new and innovative ideas uh, uh, to the market. So uh, he's had an enormous influence, really locally, nationally, internationally, uh, in uh, cardiac surgery uh, and cardiac device development. Anybody with a final question? Can you tell us a little bit more about the health fair that's going to be happening? Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> the health fair. Yes, um, we are having, as our 75th anniversary, are really going to go gangbusters in celebrating that by providing more community services. But we're going to do it a lot in one day, right here on the square, May 21st, from 10 a to 4 p. We have over 60 different vendors providing services or just education or activities. We've got Zumba, uh, bike rodeo, CPR on the square. Um, we have silent disco, oh my gosh, this is fun. If you put headphones on and nobody else can hear, you are dancing around and so you look kind of crazy, but it's really fun. Um, we have a kid zone. Um, they'll be kind of thinking it will be chunked up into like, um, it's like a safety area, like safety, focused on safety with like Red Cross and, and um, fire and um, sheriff's office. And, and then we'll have another area that is more focused on senior, activities and senior education and children's own. Um, but we have live music band, Ashley Band will be playing. Um, we have uh, uh, our mayor, like the city mayor, Gazelle Hale and I will do introductions and then you know, we'll, we'll um, do an MC. It's going to be so much fun. I'm so excited and a lot of you will be there and I hope, uh, you know, I hope that um, you'll tell all your friends and everyone and we've got the whole square plus the surrounding area. And so, um, am I missing activities? The raffle. The raffle! Oh my gosh, see? <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens. I don't have a right in front of me. No. Um, the raffle, we have, like, we have a donation of five um, bicycles. The people, we have five bikes we're giving away. And it's not just us. We have partners in this. Um, Dignity Health is one of our partners with the health fair. Red the City Together, um, the NFL Alumni Association. Um, and the city of Redwood City, which is really providing a lot of support around this, the, all of the, the public safety and the, all the things that you imagine need, traffic, flow, all that. So, yeah, so come tell everybody. Um, Lewis is just finalizing some of the marketing materials we've been telling everyone, but we'll get that out to you. Um, oh, I think I feel like there's one other thing. I don't know. Oh, the CPR on the square. There was some other stuff. Anyway, that's, yeah, you'll, you'll know when you get there. <laughs> so we want to really thank our wonderful panelists, Art Faro, Bill Graham, and Pamela Chris. Let's give them a big hand.